the NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3080 is an incredibly powerful graphics card revealed and released in September of 2020. Knowing how history went with the crypto debacle followed by the current AI bubble, these cards have remained out of reach for super casual users due to the price, but for between $300 to $400 used, is it worth considering this card 5 years after release? In some ways, absolutely, and in others there might be a bit of hesitation on my part to blanketly recommend it. Before we dig into this card, I'd like to say not to forget to leave a like and subscribe, and click the bell icon so you'll be notified about all our future uploads. This content piece was made possible by a viewer and friend MJ, who shipped me this, another card, and a 4770 so I could review and compare them to other cards and chips tested on this channel. Unfortunately, he doesn't have any social media platforms for me to plug, so if you enjoyed this review, make sure to thank MJ in the comments. With that out of the way, let's dive into the test system we'll be using. To help the 3080 achieve its full potential, I've paired the card with an i7-14700K, opportunistically boosting to 5.7GHz on all the P cores. I know that an X3D Ryzen part would technically provide the most performance, this is what I have on hand, and keep in mind that chips this powerful from any manufacturer were still over a year away at the time of this card's release. Socketing the 14700K, we've got a Gigabyte Z690 Aorus Elite AX DDR4, which has the appropriate traces to support full PCIe 4 to the 3080 in our secondary storage drive, a Western Digital Black SN771 TB, and a Timetech Gen 4 NVMe drive. This will keep the CPU and GPU fed with data, and although it probably won't help a ton in games, thanks to our 64GB pool of main memory, it's still a nice to have. Additional test bench specs are in the description should you wish to replicate anything you see in this video. Let's dive into the RTX 3080 and see how it's holding up in 2025. Starting off kind of unusually for this channel, Cyberbug2077 at the high preset and with DLSS set to quality on the transformer mode performed well at all resolutions tested, even though I will acknowledge there was some stutter at times at 1440p and beyond. Achieving an average and 1% low of 88 and 58 FPS at 1080p, there seemed to be a CPU bottleneck considering this card was sitting around 50 to 60% usage. Jumping up to 1440p and the card started to hang out at above 90% usage consistently, which might be part of why I started to notice some stutter. Even though the average and 1% low looked perfectly fine coming in at 72 and 43 FPS respectively, I would probably want to turn DLSS down a little bit from the quality setting just to gain some frames, but as is it's perfectly playable. Jumping up to 4K and the average dropped down to 60, but the 1% load didn't come in much lower compared to 1440p, reaching a relatively impressive 40fps at the much higher resolution. Cyberpunk plays excellently on this card at all resolutions, but considering we're testing at the high preset, there is still some headroom to drop resolutions and claw back some more performance at the higher resolutions. Fortnite also tested at the high preset but with Nanai and Lumen turned off, also with DLSS set to quality, and although this game is usually considered more lightweight, especially compared to Cyberpunk, its long draw distances and updated shading algorithms with Unreal Engine 5 make it surprisingly beautiful and also hard to run at the higher settings we're using. Still achieving an average and 1% low of 163 and 83 FPS at 1080p, the card is able to crush this game and remain very high refresh rate capable at this resolution, even jumping up to 1440p, and the average of 149 remains high refresh rate competitive, even if the 1% low did come in lower at 72. 4K was still very competitively viable, coming in with a 99 FPS average and 42 FPS 1% low, which honestly is kinda to be expected. We're rendering four times as many pixels as 1080p and almost doubling the amount coming from 1440p. So the fact that we're not seeing a raw halving of FPS at 4K compared to 1440p emphasizes how strong this card is thanks to its wide compute pipelines and incredibly strong memory interface. Another DirectX 12 based title, GTA 5 Enhanced Edition, and at the high RT preset with no depth of field and with DLSS set to quality, we ran into CPU bottlenecks at all resolutions tested. Unfortunately, nothing that I was able to change in the settings menu helped alleviate it, so what you see is kinda what you get with this game. Coming in with an average of 85 FPS on a 1% low of 70, none of the higher resolutions went significantly below an 80 FPS average. 
and the 1% lows came in within a frame or two of each other. The classic GTA 5 version would probably push more frames on average and at the maximum, but the enhanced edition just runs more smoothly in the 1% lows since you aren't stuttering when you're hitting engine frame rate limits. I would love to play GTA 5 online on the 3080, and although we're CPU limited, it's still beyond playable, even if an X3D part from AMD would outperform the 14700K. Marvel Rivals is another Unreal Engine 5 game built on DirectX 12, and continuing the trend of running at the high preset and with DLSS quality, we achieved decent performance relative to older Nvidia cards. Coming in with an average and 1% low of 98 and 36 at 1080p, this game seemed to have hit some stammering issues when physically in the middle of a large group of players fighting in the middle of the map. Admittedly, you don't spend an enormous amount of time doing this in a regular game, but the fact that it happens is universal to a lot of different systems. 1440p saw the average fall down to 83, with the 1% low coming in at 39. 4K maintained the 39 FPS 1% low, with the average coming in at 66, still being playable but ultimately leaving me wanting to turn down DLSS for a few extra frames. This game was great at 1080 and 1440p, but 4K leaves a little bit to be desired in my eyes. Yet at the same time, it's hard to honestly complain considering it's sticking around or above 60 FPS most of the time. Minecraft Bedrock, testing version 1.21.100, with vibrant visual set to ultra, a 16 chunk render and simulation distance, and with TAAU set to native. We also hit a CPU bottleneck at 1080 and 1440p, but seemed to be running into memory issues at 4K. Minecraft went from running at above 105 FPS on average at both 1080 and 1440p to 33 at 4K. This game really chugged at the highest resolution tested, and although it was beyond playable at 1440p and below, I'd probably just lower a few settings to gain some frames back at all resolutions. I will say this game looks amazing now with vibrant visuals, and even at the low settings it still looks incredible. Up next is the classic Gamebryo Real Engine 5 mashup that performs worse and more inconsistently than a cockroach in a microwave, Oblivion Remastered. And although the performance figures look fine in some situations, things for the most part are a stuttering mess and we're not even using most of either the CPU or the GPU. Jumping from high to medium, or even to low, doesn't improve performance whatsoever. With an average and 1% low of 42 and 9 FPS at 1080p, things jumped up to 49 FPS on average at 1440p but the 1% low fell down by a frame to 8. 4K saw the average performance drop down to 37, but the 1% low came in at 19, which makes absolutely no sense to me. This game repeatedly shows a similar performance profile, where the 1% low at 4K is somehow significantly improved over 1080 and 1440p. This game is interesting and fun to play on its own, but the performance gets in the way on literally every single system I've tested on this game. Red Dead Redemption 2, built on an updated fork of the Rockstar Advanced Game Engine, performed incredibly well at the balanced quality preset, with low grass settings and DLSS set to quality. At 1080p, the 3080 achieved an average of 109, with the 1% low coming in at 86. Jumping up to 1440p, and the average of 89 was still very smooth, and I have no issues recommending this card for this game at these resolutions. Even jumping up to 4K, and the average and 1% low came in at 72 and 57 FPS respectively, showing that this card has the skills to pay the bills in this very high quality title. Unironically, the A770 performs similarly at the same settings and resolution, which is also a testament to that card's power relative to more expensive offerings. I'd still take the 3080 over an A770 almost any day of the week, I just think it's worth mentioning because both these cards output incredibly smooth and competitive frame rates. While Rust is technically an early 2018 game, putting it firmly in the Pascal generation, meaning you'd think it would fit comfortably into at least an 8GB footprint. Unfortunately, with textures turned up to the full resolution at the medium preset, the 3080 goes from achieving a fine but occasionally stuttery 78 FPS on average and 39 for the 1% lows, we end up dropping to 21 on average at 1440p and 20 at 4K. This game, in order to achieve something that I would consider to be working, you end up needing to lower the textures to half resolution, and then everything works fine for the most part. I know Rust can be kind of extreme at some random times, so I wouldn't look too much into the stutter scene at the 1% lows, but the averages, without sacrificing some texture quality, fall off a cliff not just in this game, but a lot of other either super new 
or even moderately old titles that can crank textures or particle effects. Another Unreal Engine 5 title, The Finals, and at the high preset with dynamic RTX global illumination set to high and with DLSS set to quality, the 3080 performed well, though we hit a CPU bottleneck at 1080p. Coming in with an average and 1% low of 105 and 64 FPS respectively at 1080p, the 3080 was able to maintain the strong performance going into 1440p. With the average coming in at 103 and the 1% low at 61, the finals was still very enjoyable and competitively viable, and there were zero issues worth bringing up at these resolutions. 4K was a little bit of a different story, coming in with a 78 FPS average and a 42 FPS 1% low. The game had some stuttering issues at times, but this was usually limited to after a respawn. Most of the time you're hanging out at above 60 FPS at this resolution, but if you're really hellbent on clawing back some frames, then turning down the settings or DLSS level would help significantly, and would make me comfortable recommending this card at all the resolutions tested, just with the slight stutter caveat at 4K. And last but not least, Warzone performed very well at all resolutions, but similarly to the finals, there were some stuttering present, unfortunately it was here at all resolutions tested though. With the 1080p average coming in at 116, this was very smooth, and the 1% low of 57 remains relatively playable, though these drops were noticeable a few times. 1440p saw the average drop down to 111, which is still very high refresh rate capable, but the 1% low of 45 saw some stuttering that was more noticeable than at 1080p. And finally, 4K remained very playable on average, coming in at 83 FPS, but the 1% low remained similar to 1440p, only achieving 42 FPS. I would probably recommend lowering some settings and DLSS if you want to maintain the most amount of frames possible. And honestly, in this competitive game, I don't think it matters too much if you do decide to lower some settings. However, at the same time, this seems like it might be both a combination of running out of memory for textures and also just rendering at higher resolutions. I would still happily play Warzone on the 3080, I just think it needs some adjusting in the settings before you hop in. NVIDIA's Ampere architecture, although it features similar performance per watt as to what's found in Touring, has some major modifications on the floating point pipelines that increase graphics throughput enormously. In typical 3D rendering scenarios, you end up using large amounts of 32-bit single precision floating point instructions under the hood to perform your geometric transformations, ray computations, or really anything requiring subpixel detail. NVIDIA GPUs have been large banks of programmable FP32 cores for at least 20 years now, and Ampere offers a jump in performance by literally doubling the number of these FP32 data paths. Unfortunately, doubling data paths doesn't double performance, but it did provide a solid 15-30% to jump in raw performance for a similar percentage jump in power draw. The 3080 in particular actually sports a similar number of SMs to a 2080 Ti, coming in with 68 active. However, the available FP32 data path count has doubled to 8,704. Compared to a 3090, this is over 1,000 data paths cut down, but relative to a 3070 or 3070 Ti, this is 20 more SMs available, equating to 2,560 extra FP32 capable CUDA cores. As a result, this card can crush gaming workloads at 1080, 1440p, and 4K. However, because of the memory capacity on this flavor of the 3080, it actually runs into hard bottlenecks in quite a few titles, even ones that aren't all that modern. Sporting 10G DDR6X controllers clocked at 19 gigabit per second. This equates to a 320-bit interface rocking over 760 gigabytes per second of throughput. However, this card only has 1 gigabyte modules per controller, meaning we get 10 gigabytes of total memory. Back in 2020, this wasn't an enormous issue, but a lot of reviewers pointed out that it'll become an issue a few years down the line. Unfortunately, we're now quite a few years down the line, and this capacity for 1440p and 4K, at the settings this card can comfortably render at, is much too restrictive. If possible, I'd be more comfortable recommending the 12GB flavor of the 3080 just for the increased memory capacity, because as it stands, it gets outperformed by a 4070 at the same settings at 1440p and 4K, just because the 40 series card has 2 extra gigs of memory. For me, I don't really mind turning down texture quality to make the games fit into this more restrictive memory footprint, but some people do mind a lot, and it might be a turnoff for this slightly older card. The caches on this card are also very restrictive when compared to cheaper 40 series cards, but compared to GPUs up until 2020, 
the large 128 kilobyte private L1 cache and 64 kilobyte block of texture cache per SM meant each core could actually feed the double data path counts. The 5 megs of L2 is where this card remains beastly when compared to older Nvidia cards. But compared to even a 4060, this is tiny, but is also made up for in part by the incredibly quick DRAM interfaces. Even though you're pinging the device's RAM more often thanks to cache limits, the RAM you do have can transfer a lot of data per second, even if it does have much higher latency. Operating frequencies on this card come in much higher than the stock frequency sanctioned by Nvidia, with an out-of-the-box base clock of 1440 MHz and a boost clock of 1710 MHz. This card, in actuality, hung out just below the 2 GHz mark very consistently, and hit a frequency wall just above it. The card seems to know when it can push itself, as Nvidia has gotten pretty good about doing this since Pascal. And when power draw and heat output increases, the card usually only throttles by about 100 MHz, still retaining well over 1800 MHz under intense load. I think these frequencies are impressive considering over 9000 compute elements are being kept at these frequencies, including over 8700 CUDA data paths, 272 texture mapping units, 96 rasterization operation pipelines, and an additional 272 tensor cores. These new cores were introduced with Turing, but the raw number coming from Turing was actually halved in Ampere. This is probably because the tensor cores can operate on more data types and enter sparse mode, making them physically larger despite there being a half node shrink. Translating this to actual compute figures, and the 3080 at the higher operating frequencies can push almost 34 teraflops of FP32 and FP16. It can also fill over 187 billion pixels per second to your screen, and map over 530 billion texels to render geometry. This is, quite frankly, an insane amount of compute throughput for any sort of graphics card, and it helps the card maintain its place in the graphics card hierarchy despite it being over 5 years old at this point in time. This comes in very similarly to the 4070 in terms of on-paper compute figures, but this being a wider and slower clock chip makes the card a slightly stronger contender in my mind as long as you don't mind sacrificing some texture quality. Subsequently though, power draw on this card ranges from a pretty routine 100 watts to around 250 watts under load, but it can draw upwards of 350 watts in some isolated scenarios. I found the card spends most of its time between 200 and 300 watts under load, which is similar to a 3070 Ti that I used to own, but it has the ability to draw a lot more when it needs to. And at the same time, I never had any sort of issue on my 750 watt power supply. This card also uses the new-ish 12-pin Firewire connector, and although it comes with an adapter dongle, I still trust regular Molex PCIe 8 pins slightly more because of the physical size of the connector. But that being said, I never ran into any issues with this card or any other device using this connector.